Welcome to the Russian Rulers History Podcast, Episode 83, The Battle for the Motherland. Well, I hope you're prepared for a monumental podcast. This will be the longest one I've done to date. Uh, it is an important one. It is on the battles of Moscow, Leningrad, and Stalingrad, and some of the greatest loss of life in human history and war. So let's get into it. Last time, he recounted how Stalin went into a deep funk when he was informed of the sweeping Nazi successes in the Ukraine and Belarus, but it was all a ruse to gain more power over his subordinates. The boss knew he needed to drum up support from the people, especially with the war going so poorly. Because of this, Stalin was made aware that the metropolitan of the Lebanon hills, Ilya, and how he had gone into an underground cell to pray for Russia. When he came out after fasting and staying awake for three days, he claimed to have heard from Holy Mary, Mother of Jesus. He said in a letter, quote, The churches and monasteries must be reopened throughout the country. Priests must be brought back from imprisonment. Leningrad must not be surrendered, but the sacred icon of Our Lady of Kazan should be carried around the city boundary, taken on to Moscow, where a service should be held, and thence to Stalingrad. The priests were recalled from the gulags. Some 20,000 churches were reopened, and a patriarch, one Metropolitan Sergei, was met by members of the Bolshevik party for the first time since 1917. This is in stark contrast to Stalin's 1938 decree for his godless five-year plan, where the last of the churches were to be shuttered and the last priest taken away. Stalin was now set up for a terrible disappointment. His son, Yakov Jugashvili, was captured by the Germans and was quoted as saying that he realized that resistance was pointless and voluntarily came over to the German side. The Nazis, once they realized who they had captured, had a public relations field day. They began to drop leaflets on Soviet army positions with pictures of Yakov and German soldiers. Stalin had a report on his son which said, quote, A leaflet was dropped by fascist aircraft. It showed a group of German officers talking to Yakov. Yakov was wearing a tunic without belt. The caption read, Stalin's son, Yakov Jugashvili, full lieutenant, battery commander, has surrendered. That such an important Soviet officer has surrendered proves beyond a doubt that all resistance to the German army is completely pointless. So stop fighting and come over to us. His son was a traitor. But was he? Turns out he really wasn't. Zhukov had a conversation that he wrote about in his memoirs. Quote, Comrade Stalin, I said, I've been waiting and wanting for some time to ask you about your son, Yakov. Is there any more news of his fate? He did not answer my question immediately. He took at least a hundred steps around the room and then said, in a strangely muffled voice, Yakov will never escape. They'll shoot him murdering swine that they are. From what we've been able to learn, he is kept isolated from the other prisoners and is under pressure to betray the motherland. He was silent for a moment, and then added confidently, Yakov would sooner die than betray his motherland. He sat at the table for a long time in silence, without touching his food. In 1943, Yakov, knowing that his capture was a disgrace, made a dash for the electrified fence, feigning an escape attempt. He was shot in the head after numerous warnings to halt. There are others who claim that he committed suicide after learning of the massacre in the Katyn forest ordered by his father, and others say he was murdered when Stalin refused to swap his son for Field Marshal Paulus. Order number 270 was now being put into full force. Families of men who were captured were being executed publicly. Generals and officers who had led their men in retreat were shot. As this report shows, there was little hesitancy in carrying out the order. Army General D. Pavlov, formerly commanding the Western Front, V. Klimovsky, a former chief of staff 
A. Grigoriev, former chief of communications, Western Front, being found guilty of cowardice, inaction, mismanagement, and deliberate disorganization of the troops, are to be shot. German general Blumenritt reported, quote, the conduct of the Russian troops in retreat was strikingly different from that of the Poles of the Western Allies. Even when they were surrounded, they did not leave their positions. General Haider wrote, Russia, a colossus that deliberately prepared for war, was underestimated by us. When the war began, we had 200 divisions against us. Now, on August 11, 1941, after the blood losses they have suffered, we estimate the number of divisions is 360. Even if we smash a dozen of them, the Russians will organize another dozen. Hitler's generals were becoming more and more aware that Stalin could and would throw as many men as was needed against the Germans, and that his supply was almost endless. White army survivors initially greeted the Germans at first, but when they began to turn on them as news of Nazi atrocities leaked out, Hitler had thought that the Russians would turn on Stalin. Fuhrer once said, one good kick at the door and the whole rotten structure will collapse immediately. The question that begs to be answered is, why didn't Hitler use the dissatisfied Russians for help? The answer is that he felt them racially inferior, like the Jews. And let's face it, Hitler was an idiot when it came to military matters. Even though the Cossacks and many Ukrainians were brutally treated during Stalin's purges, the Nazis were far worse. Only one army switched sides, Lieutenant General Vlasov's. My uncle, my mother's brother, would fight for this army. He would also lose his life in the war, or was captured and executed by the Soviets. We never found out what his fate was. Vlasov's army was joined by the remaining white army generals, Krasnov and Sukhorov. This Russian Liberation Army was eventually crushed, and many who served and didn't die in the war were eventually hunted down and either shot or hung on the gallows. Then, the miracle that Metropolitan Ilya had said would come true if the churches were reopened and the priests returned, did. The notorious Russian winter came early, very early, with a vengeance. On October 7th it came, which caught Hitler's troops completely off guard. They hadn't thought to bring any winter clothing. That and the supply lines were too long and thin. Temperatures dropped to minus 8 Celsius, or 16 degrees Fahrenheit, by November 3rd. On October 15th, Stalin ordered Moscow to evacuate, except troops, as the Germans were only 20 miles away. Prisoners were quickly executed, the archives that couldn't be moved in time were burned, and women and children were packed into trains heading east. The German army was beginning to suffer as the cold halted their tanks. The Russian army, under Grigory Zhukov, was poised to counterattack, and the general begged Stalin to give him much-needed reinforcements. But strangely, Stalin refused. Actually, it would turn out to be a stroke of genius. As Molotov put in his autobiography, quote, At this juncture, all the subunits were calling for reinforcements. Operation in the Moscow area were under Zhukov's battalion. But however hard he begged, Stalin wouldn't give him so much as a battalion. He just told him to hold on at any price. Stalin then had five armies up to full strength and equipped with modern arms, including the new heavily armored T-34 tank. We thought at the time that Stalin was making a terrible mistake. But when the Germans had lost enough blood, he activated those units. Stalin was waging a war of attrition, sacrificing brave men for the motherland. It was also a brilliant strategy, as the Germans were fighting on his turf, in his winter, with his unlimited army in the back just waiting to pounce. As men were ready to blow, blow up the Kremlin, Stalin told the guards, much to their amazement, Clear the mines at once, and light the stove. 
I'll get on with some work in the meantime. He then told the drop-jawed men that he was not leaving Moscow for anywhere else, and you are staying with me. We will not surrender Moscow. Now let's step back a bit in time to early September to talk about Leningrad and its siege. The chief of staff for the early part of the war was Georgi Zhukov. When the battle for Kiev was going on, Stalin and he had a terrible fight, because while Zhukov wanted to abandon Kiev and move the troops to a more defendable position, Stalin was firmly against it. The boss thought ideas of abandoning Kiev were nonsense, which made Zhukov reply, If you think the chief of the general staff talks nonsense, then I have no business here. I ask that you relieve me from the post of the chief of the general staff and send me to the front. There, apparently, I shall be of greater use to this country. Stalin granted his wish, but kept him on as a member of the Soviet high command, known as Stavka. Leningrad had been attacked at this point by the German Army Group North, which was under siege. It has been hotly debated whether the Germans wanted to enter Leningrad or not, but there's a record of an order from Hitler not to go in and to starve the inhabitants out. But there was other information that suggests that if there was an opening, the German army would go in and destroy the city and all its inhabitants. Voroshilov was commanding the defense and doing a fairly lousy job when Stalin called Zhukov to his office and had the following conversation after sacking as the chief of staff. Where will you be off to now? Stalin asked. Back to the front, replied Zhukov. Which front? The one you consider most necessary. Then go to Leningrad at once. The situation is almost hopeless there. Stalin then handed Zhukov a note which read, Hand over command to Zhukov and fly to Moscow immediately. He handed the general another note that said, Today Voroshilov's recalled. Flying to Leningrad, Zhukov took immediate control. Yelling at the staff, he said, Don't you understand that if Anatov's division doesn't occupy the line, the Germans will break into the city? And then I'll have you shot in front of the Smolny as a traitor. They immediately knew who their boss was. Voroshilov, worried about his future, said to his staff, Ah, goodbye, comrades. Stavka's recalled me. That's what an old man like me deserves. This isn't the Civil War. Now we have to fight differently. But don't doubt for a minute that we'll smash the fascist scum. Stalin feared that Leningrad was a lost cause and that it might have to be abandoned. But Zhukov, along with Andrei Zhdanov and Alexei Kuznetsov, had their men dig in and halt the German advance. The Nazi army had entered the outskirts of the city and set up command posts in some of the buildings. So Stalin sent the following order. When moving forward, don't try to capture one or other point, but burn to ashes these populated areas, so the German staffs and units will be buried. Toss away any sentiment and destroy all populated areas you meet on your way. Again, sacrificing the population to achieve his goal, showed Stalin had no compunction on the loss of life of his people. At this point, the fighting so fierce and the German losses so great that Hitler called off the main assault and ordered that Leningrad be starved to death. Thus began the infamous 872-day, or 2.4-year, siege. The population of the city was 2.2 million, and they were virtually cut off from supplies of food. All these poor people could do is try to survive. A number of the people were also refugees from Peskov and Novgorod. Estimates say that there were about 300,000 of them. The siege of Leningrad is one of the great tragedies of the 20th century. It is hard to imagine the suffering that went on. People died left and right, some just walking down the street, falling to the ground. Others visited friends, said their goodbyes, walked outside, sat down on the sidewalk, and died. 
cannibalism was common. 700 people died each day from starvation during the siege. All in all, approximately 1 million soldiers were either killed, captured, or missing. 2.5 million were wounded or sick from disease. 642,000 civilians died during the siege, and about 400,000 died during attempted evacuations. The Finnish army surrounded the northern border near Lake Lagoda, but did not further their attack. They just sat back and waited the Russians out, not even firing artillery shells into the city. Germany's chief of staff, Alfred Jodl, went to Helsinki to urge the Finnish government to press the attack, but he was rebuffed. They stayed on their side of the Gulf of Finland and Lake Lagoda and played a waiting game. To try to get supplies in there, were there were attempts made to ferry supplies through a narrow band open to the Soviets through the lake, but many of the ships were sunk by enemy fire. In the winter, the lake was frozen, and trucks tried to get through. This was known as the road of life, although because of the large number of casualties suffered, it was also known as the road of death. The Americans were doing their best to supply food and military supplies to the beleaguered city through the far north ports, but the going was tough, especially in winter. Aside from the appalling loss of life, was the loss of some of the architecture and art that surrounded the city where the Germans had control. Destroyed were many of the palaces of the Tsars, like the Catherine Palace, Peterhof, Gachina, and many more. The Germans stole anything they could get their hands on and spirited away back to Berlin. The Soviets would get some of it back when they took the city, but much was destroyed. When the Germans realized they couldn't take the city, they decided that they needed to move some of their forces south toward the battle for Moscow. The 4th Panzer Group was ordered to transfer itself to Army Group Center for the attack on Moscow. All around Moscow, teenagers, women, men of all ages began to dig trenches around the city. They laid anti-tank mines on the narrow roads that led towards the capital through the dense forest. By mid-October 1941, the Wehrmacht pressed towards Moscow, led by Generals Heinz Guderian, Fyodor von Bock, and Alfred Kesserling, with constant orders coming from that lowly colonel from World War I, Adolf Hitler. The German army came to within 20 miles of Moscow and was poised to take the city when they were met with the first pushback they had ever encountered. Not only was the defense of the city brilliant, but something new happened. They were attacked by, attacked by a new tank, the heavily armored T-34 Soviet tank. The Germans had no weapons that could penetrate its armor. A quote in David Glantz's book, When Titans Clashed, the German and the Red Army were like, quote, punch-drunk boxers, staying precariously on their feet, but rapidly losing the power to hurt each other. The German forces had little left in their proverbial gas tanks, with only one-third of the tanks and trucks still functional. Regular army divisions were at half strength, and logistics problems prevailed. All in all, neither side was strong enough to fight, but the Russians had a huge number of advantages, one being they had lots of reserves in the east, and another being this was their home, and they knew the lay of the land far better than the Germans did. The winter had dug in, and so did the Red Army. Temperatures were down to 20 to 30 below, and below zero, and the trucks and tanks of the Wehrmacht had ground to a halt. Over 130,000 German soldiers came down with cases of frostbite. As General Heinz Guderian wrote in his journal, quote, The offensive on Moscow failed. We underestimated the enemy's strength as well as his size and climate. Fortunately, I stopped my troops on 5 December. Otherwise, the catastrophe would be unavoidable. The high command in Berlin ordered the German army to take a defensive position 
throughout the entire front in anticipation of a Soviet assault. But they believed that they had victory at hand, as their intelligence told them that the Russians had no more reserves. Oh, were they ever wrong. Not only did they have reserves, 58 divisions worth, but they had way more airplanes and tanks than the Germans even imagined they could. One of the reasons for the large number of reserves is that the Russians no longer sensed a threat from the Japanese, and that freed up all those men. Had the Japanese even threatened to invade far eastern Russia, the war might have had a very different outcome. On December 14th of 1941, Guderian had strongly argued for retreating to better positions, which was initially approved by high command. Well, unfortunately for the Germans, Hitler stupidly rescinded the order and commanded that they stay in the positions they had and to dig trenches and prepare to continue the battles where they were. Guderian furiously argued that the men were unable to do that and that they were suffering terribly due to the winter and that warm clothes were hundreds of miles behind them, stuck in Poland. Guderian, along with Generals Hopner, von Bock, and Strauss were recalled. This was another example of Hitler's meddling into tactics that he was just unable to comprehend. Then, as if to further punish the German army, the temperature near Moscow reached a record 43 below zero Fahrenheit. From there, the Red Army pushed back the Germans, about 60 to 120 miles away from Moscow. Operation Barbarossa had failed. Hitler was not defeated, though, not by any stretch, but now Stalin had the upper hand, as he could afford a battle of attrition, and the Germans couldn't. Now it's time to move forward to the Battle of Stalingrad, the deadliest battle of World War II, and one that was to prove the utter disregard for human life that Stalin portrayed throughout his blood reign. Starting on August 23, 1942, and lasting until February 2, 1943, almost two million men were to die defending and attacking the city once known as Tsaritsyn, today known as Volgograd. The German war effort was still going well. Rommel had captured Tobruk and North Africa from the British. The Eastern Front in Russia was secure, despite not winning the battle for Moscow, and the Leningrad siege was still in place with the Russians suffering far greater losses than the Germans. The Allies had still not invaded Europe, so Germany was still fighting a one-front war, a war with their arch-rivals, the Soviet Union. In 1942, Hitler knew he had to go on the offensive before the United States inevitably joined the war. And on top of that, he had to get the oil resources in the Caucasus, which he so desperately needed. So this is why we focus on the most horrific of the battles in Russia, the Battle of Stalingrad. The Battle of Stalingrad marked the end of the Wehrmacht successes and started the beginning of the end for Hitler and his regime. The loss of both civilian and military lives was staggering, to say the least. Estimates are that the Germans and their allies, the Italians, Croatians, Romanians, and Hungarians, suffered 750,000 deaths with 91,000 men captured. Of the men captured, only a little over 5,000 men returned to Germany in 1955. The Russian losses were even more horrendous. Over 470,000 military men killed or missing, 650,000 wounded and sick, and 40,000 civilians died. The city itself was completely destroyed. The plan by the Germans was to attack Stalingrad using Army Group B, led by Marshal Friedrich Paulus, with additional command coming from Berlin from von Manstein and the meddling Adolf Hitler. The battle began on August 23, 1942. Stupidly, Hitler had ordered the whole of Army Group South to split into two sections, A and B. Army Group A was to head to the Caucasus to try and capture the oil fields that the Germans so desperately needed. 
show how meddlesome and idiotic Hitler was at this time, he ordered the 4th Panzer Army to link up with Army Group A, but when it arrived, the ensuing traffic jam stopped the advance completely. Then Hitler ordered the 4th Panzer Army head back and rejoin Army Group B, wasting valuable time and precious resources. On the Red Army side, Commissar of the region Nikita Khrushchev and Marshal Andrei Yermyoyenko were assigned the duty of defending Stalingrad. With them, they started out with a mere 187,000 men, but when they reached full strength, the number swelled to 1.1 million. The initial foray into Stalingrad was provided by the Luftwaffe, who dropped 1,000 tons of bombs on the city, effectively leveling it. Thousands of civilian and military casualties re resulted from the airstrikes. The anti-aircraft defenses, the 1077th Anti-Aircraft Regiment, a unit made up mostly of young female volunteers who had no training for engaging ground targets, but fought bravely to the last against what was now a full-fledged panzer divisions. The Germans were shocked to see that they had been fighting women as they came into Stalingrad. Within Stalingrad, factories that produced the heavily armored T-34 tanks continued producing them throughout the initial phases of the battle. Sometimes they were produced and rushed out the door, headed straight for the front line without even being painted. With the Germans now in Stalingrad, the boss reiterated order number 227, which he released on July 27, 1942, in which he stated that all commanders who ordered unauthorized retreat would be subject to a tribunal and shot. Slogans such as, not a step back, and there's no land behind the Volga, were rallying cries used by the Red Army. This caused heavy German casualties, as they went on fighting street to street, building to building, room to room, pushing forward into Stalingrad. The Red Army, now very familiar with German tactics, which had infantry tied closely to tanks, getting major support from the Luftwaffe, decided on a tactic called hugging. Here they would move in very tightly to the Germans, sometimes only feet away, forcing infantry to separate from the tanks and negating the Luftwaffe's superior firepower. Also, the Germans were almost unstoppable in an open field, but here in Stalingrad, the rubble made tank warfare difficult, in some places impossible, thus changing an advantage into a disadvantage. Fighting sometimes went on in the sewers of the city, causing the Germans to call it rat warfare. They would fight in buildings where the Russians would shoot down through the holes in the floor and the Germans would shoot up through the holes in the ceiling. The fighting was brutal, with heavy casualties on both sides. But after a while, the Germans had taken 90% of the city. But that was okay for Stalin, Zhukov, Khrushchev, and Marshal Yeryomenko, as they had plans for the Germans. Plans to encircle and destroy Army Group B. Operation Uranus was a plan concocted by Georgi Zhukov and Alexander Vasilevsky. They knew by now what the weak part of the German lines were in the north, as they, was, those, though, they were the poorly equipped and trained Hungarian and Romanian units. Uranus was to be launched in conjunction with Operation Mars, which was directed at Army Group Center, not far from Moscow. This was done to prevent any detachments from the Center Army to be used at reinforcements in the south. Another part of the plan was to squeeze the Germans in Stalingrad from the south and north, then perform a double envelopment, one circle pointing inward to prevent escape, and one circle pointing outward to prevent reinforcements. It's a similar tactic that Julius Caesar used in subduing Gaul, defeating Vercingetorix at the Battle of Alesia in 52 BC, some 2,000 years before. On November 19, 1942, Operation Uranus commenced, led by General Nikolai Vatutin. The Red Army counteroffensive included the First Guards Army, 
5th Tank Army, and 21st Army. It also had 18 infantry divisions, 8 tank brigades, 2 motorized brigades, 6 cavalry divisions, and 1 anti-tank brigade. First the northern flank was attacked, following by the southern flank being attacked the next day. Within days, over 290,000 German soldiers were encircled, as well as 10,000 Red Army soldiers. Hitler ordered that his men not leave the city, and they, they should fight the Soviets any way they knew how. Goring swore that the Luftwaffe could supply the men inside the city using an air bridge, but that failed miserably, as the air defense surrounding the city was vastly improved from the earlier battles. Then, as always, came the Russian winter. Manstein tried to relieve the trapped men in Operation Wintergewitter, but the Red Army held their ground and repulsed the December attack. On December 16th, Operation Little Saturn was launched by the Russians to retake Rostov. Although it failed, it caused Manstein to take forces meant to relieve the Stalingrad forces north. This sealed the fate of the men inside the city. By January 22nd, General Paulus asked for permission from Berlin to surrender. No answer was forthcoming from Hitler. Paulus was made into a field marshal with the thought that this would force him to fight on and not allow for a man of that high of a stature to be captured. Hunger was killing many of his men, and by now their ammunition was beginning to run out. Zhukov decided to squeeze harder. An offer to surrender was given and rejected, but by February 2, 1943, the Germans decided enough is enough and surrendered. Out of the 750,000 men who went into Stalingrad, only 91,000 marched out. As I mentioned before, 27,000 died on the march to the internment camps, many from typhus. It was a crushing defeat of the once mighty Wehrmacht and signaled the beginning of the end of the war in Russia. General Paulus, for his part, remained in the Soviet Union until 1952 when he moved to the East German city of Dresden, where he lived out the last three years of his life, convinced that he did the right thing by surrendering. Operation Mars, going on almost simultaneously with Operation Uranus, was launched in the Rezhev and Veliki Luki salients. For those who don't know what a salient is, it's kind of like a bulge into enemy territory. You might be familiar with the Western salient that the Germans created, known as the Battle of the Bulge. The Soviet offensive was led by General Georgi Zhukov, with the Germans in their defensive positions led by German General Walter Model. In the beginning of the battle, conditions were just atrocious. On the morning of November 25, 1942, it was foggy and snowing. While the Red Army was launching a ferocious artillery barrage, no one was able to see if they were hitting their intended targets or not. Compounding things, it was so hard to see that sometimes the Russian infantry would race by a German stronghold, which was still fully functional, and they would get caught behind enemy lines. Attacks and counterattacks continued day and night. The Germans, short of reserves because of the Battle of Stalingrad, fought against all odds as they were outnumbered by an estimated two to one. Wave after wave of infantry, tanks and artillery came at the Germans, but they were consistently repulsed, inflicting severe losses on the Red Army. The goal of Operation Mars was to crush the Germans in the center and then hook up with the divisions of the Red Army north near Moscow. This part of Zhukov's plan failed miserably, and cost the lives of 100,000 Russians with 235,000 wounded. For this reason, the battles were known as the Rezhev Meat Grinder. The Germans, for their part, lost 40,000 men, which they were ill-equipped to lose. Furthermore, the operation did have one benefit for the Soviets. The Germans realized they couldn't hold the salient, and they were forced to retreat. Considering the superior forces that Zhukov had, it is not surprising that this battle was not well known in the West, as the Soviet propaganda machine dismissed it as a mere diversion for the Stalingrad offensive. 
But as author David Glantz puts it in his book, Zhukov's Greatest Defeat, the Red Army's Epic Disaster in Operation Mars, quote, In the unlikely event that Zhukov was correct and Mars was really a diversion, there has never been one so ambitious, so large, so clumsily executed, or so costly. In Leningrad, preparations were being made on both sides to go on the offensive. The Soviets had the Senyavino offensive planned for early autumn in 1942, using the second shock and the eighth armies to try to lift the blockade. The Germans were simultaneously planning Operation Nordlicht to take the city. On August 27th, the Russians began the attack. It was a mad plan, and within two days, the shock, second shock army was encircled and destroyed. But the upshot of the operation was that it did halt Operation Nordlicht and stop the Nazi attempt to take Leningrad by force. Operation Iskra, or in English, Operation Spark, was started on January 12, 1943. Fierce fighting went on for six days around Lake Lagoda, when on January 18th there was a breakthrough by the Russians, and a narrow seven-mile corridor on land was achieved, allowing for more supplies to get into the beleaguered city. Still, it would be more than a year before the siege was fully lifted and the rout of the Germans began. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's monumental podcast. It was a hard one to work on emotionally due to the enormous amount of human suffering that occurred during these battles. Next week, we're going to begin to cover Stalin as he leads his country in reversing all the previous losses and begins the drive of the Germans back to Berlin. We'll also begin to see how Stalin begins to play on the world stage with people like Winston Churchill and Roosevelt. Now, please don't forget to visit the new website that's just being constructed at www.russianrulershistory.com. And also, uh, those of you who might not know, we have a, a Russian Rulers uh, iPhone app that's available through the iTunes Store. Uh, also, you can join us on Facebook at Russian Rulers History Podcast, so you can ask a question, leave a comment, or make a suggestion. But now, as always, Tasvidanya is pasiba bolshoya.